Hello gardeners and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're here to answer questions, talk about all things plants and things that are related to plants because we are plant geeks. Okay, so let's move right along. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of ACES. But I have three highly intelligent guests. Don't mess, you know, don't mess with us. Yeah, I was gonna say, don't mess up my, my adjective. They're highly intelligent. And so they're going to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their expertise and then we'll go into some questions. I'm gonna start first with you, Dr. Tom Voigt. Hi, I'm Tom Voigt. I uh, also am at the University of Illinois in the Department of Crop Sciences. Uh, I work with perennial grasses, so if you have any questions uh, related to turf or uh, ornamental grasses or landscape grasses, uh, um, uh, call, call in. Um, I have a show and tell here, and this is this is uh, when uh, I love grass uh, grasses, but 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 this is when grasses go awry. This is uh, the hardy pampas grass, or excuse me, hardy uh, fountain grass, uh, Penicetum allopecuroides, and uh, it's not supposed to be uh, able to create uh, create viable seed. It's a it's a clone that's supposed to be an outcrosser, but I think. Uh, we see a lot of this in, in turf and so you get these large patches uh, a shiny green wiry leaves and you can see that it, it mows very poorly in the edge of, of the leaves uh, shred uh, here's actually a little flower you might look at that and think that's a, a foxtail of some type um, we did some research with this uh, tr uh, looking at uh, trying to find uh, ways to selectively control this we found that uh, quinclorac was a uh, in the chemical drive was a was probably the the best selective herbicide for this although it was uh, really um, it didn't work consistently we did this at Purdue and we did this here in Urbana and and uh, it worked a little bit some places didn't work in other years when we tried it uh, roundup um, was was the most uh, um, the most uh, uh, effective uh, and consistent control with this unfortunately as you know roundup is non-selective and, and it'll damage your turf as well as the uh, the undesirable desirable uh, grassy weed here. So if you do use any pesticides, be sure to read and understand and follow all the label instructions. Well spoken, but that is a pain right. in the lawn. See, it seems to fall, you know, you use this grass as a, as a facer plant a lot and this the seeds fall into the mm -hmm. into the turf below the, the plant. The plant shades, the turf thins, the seeds germinate, there you've got these large patches. Although so these were collected in a, in a bed or in a, in a turf that was probably six or seven feet away from the from the bed. So wow. it will spread. Yeah. And it started out so beautifully and then it went yeah. awry. So yeah. thank yeah. you for covering that. But so, not rye. But not rye. Not it was a rye. It went a rye. That's yes. right. Yes. All right. Well, let's go next to you, Mary Ann Metz. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann Metz. I'm a horticulturalist and landscape designer and a gardener and collect a number of different perennials. And I have um, a great interest in peonies, tree peonies, hosta, and just a whole bunch of other perennials. So give me a call, I'd love to uh, give you some answers. But I'd like to share with you something for the fall. Uh, fall is the beginning of what we see usually as kind of a uh, gray, not so pleasant time. But I am here to show you color that you can have probably, I would guess, for the ne next five or six weeks in chrysanthemums or mums. If I say chrysanthemums to some people, they don't know what I'm talking about. So mums, <laughs> um, that would be this side of the display. And on this side, pansies, pansies, gosh, they love cool weather. So the mm -hmm. fall is an exceptional time to put pansies in. Uh, bloom really well. I've even had people tell me that they bloom underneath snow. So they, they live through a lot of cold, winters in this part of the country and then die in the very hot summers of, in this part of the country. So lots and lots of color that you can get this time of year. Um, mums, weeks and weeks and weeks of color, big balls of color, just a fabulous thing to do in your garden. And they look great together. Yes, they do. It's Absolutely. A beautiful palette. And with a pumpkin, oh my gosh. Oh yes. Nice, nice coloration. Very nice. Well, thank you, Mary Ann. And now we're gonna go to you, David Robson. Thanks, Diane. I'm David Robson. I'm also with the uh, Department of Crop Sciences, College of, uh, of ACES. I'm a pesticide and horticultural specialist. Um, I cover everything, I will say, except turf grass, peonies, Japanese <laughs> maples, everything that Mary Ann grows, and I grow it as well. And so we 
had this great relation uh, back and forth. Um, this is a question that actually came during the summer, but really is appropriate right now. Uh, they have a pink flowering almond. All of a sudden, it seemed that it had a tremendous amount of growth. They didn't get it pruned before the growth. Is it too late to prune the shrub now? And they do want it to flower next spring. And it's bringing up the whole point of any spring flowering shrub, whether it be the almonds, whether it be the trees like the apples, the peaches, the cherries, the forsythias, the lilacs, they're all setting flower buds right now. It's uh, autumn, the temperatures have cooled. Once that happens, the flower buds start forming. If you go out and prune, you're gonna be pruning off those flower buds for next spring. It won't kill the plant. You'll just sacrifice that one year's worth of blooms. It's probably gonna be better to not prune right now unless you need to because of structure or it's blocking something or something is dead, winter injury, that type of prevention. Wait till next spring. After they're done flowering, that's the best time to prune any of the spring flowering shrubs and trees. Very well spoken. Thank you very much. All right, let's go to a Did You Know next. Snapdragon flowers resemble a dragon, and if you squeeze the sides, the dragon's mouth will appear to open and close. That is one of my favorite flowers to talk about in class because of the snap of the snapdragon head. All right, let's go to the phone lines and see what our callers have for us. We're going to start first on line three with Tony about tomatoes. Hi, Tony. How you doing, Diane? Doing great. All right. Hey, uh, my tomatoes are starting to set flowers again. Uh, the question is, is will these flowers have enough time to produce tomatoes this year? No. I was going to say no also. No. Uh, there's two no's and yeses on this No, nope, I have a no for him. No. It, what's going to end up happening is that it's a very hot season, warm season plant. And as we're getting in these nights of 48 degrees, 40s, and days in the 60s, that flower may develop uh, but more than likely, it's probably going to fall off, and that fruit will never get a large size. So it's unanimous, but it's a great question because we do get that question. Yes. Oh, yes. So thank you, Tony, for asking that question so everyone can learn from that. Well, let's go to Paula's questions now. question on line four about strawberries. Hi, Paula. Paula, are you there? Oh, we wanted to talk about strawberries, too. We, yeah. we were <laughs> discussing it before the show. So no line four with Paula. I'm here. Oh, good. What's Hang your on. question? Okay. I have a about a five-year-old strawberry patch, mm -hmm. and it didn't do very well this spring. And I would like to dig up maybe 25, 30, 35, 40 plants and till that ground and then plant those. Is this a bad time? I'd say it, it's probably an okay time. Yeah. Probably not the best. Not the I best. Wouldn't do it it's any a, later. Yeah. I yeah. always worry about small plants with frost heaving. Yeah, you know, you'd, you'd, is, you'd be wanting probably to do a lot yeah. of, of mulching with mm -hmm. that with digging yep. at this time. It's not maybe the worst time. I'm, I'm later would be worse, but it's not the optimum time. But it, tomorrow, it can't be Paula. done. Yeah, do it. Yeah, <laughs> do it right now. <laughs> Seven thirty or eight thirty or yeah. as soon as you're done with us. But yeah. as Tom was mentioning, with the frost heaving, that just means shallow rooted things get moved up, up out down, of the yeah. soil. So do mulch them very well. I know one of our students worked for a landscape company and they planted coral bells, which are mm -hmm. just like strawberries, very shallow rooted. Very. And they frost heaved 90% of them oh, out gosh. of a very large landscape yes. wow. along the Chicago, oh. <laughs> all <laughs> along through Chicago. So, but they did, were able to find, and I think, and put them back in, but it was a lot of extra work. It is. Please mulch it Mulch, well. mulch, mulch. And now, straw is a good mulch. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, but you kind of wait till the ground starts to freeze before you start putting the mulch on. And I do use a lot of aged bark chips, not fresh, but aged. Um, so compost, yes. you could use compost. Absolutely. And then that would help the plant as well. 
Uh, while thank you very much, Paula. While we're on strawberries, let's talk about we had some look-alike strawberry plants we were talking oh, about yeah. before the show that might not be the plant you want. But discuss <clears throat> that for us. Well, I, this this year it seems uh, as though we've seen. I know I have some in my yard, um, uh, uh, but we've seen some of our turf plots and some of our research farms. Uh, the the what's called mock strawberry, uh, mm -hmm. Duchesnia indica, or sometimes called Potentilla indica, uh, and it's, it makes it fl it's making little red fruit now that kind of look like a strawberry. Um, uh, they're shiny and glossy. Um, uh, they, uh, according to the literature, are edible, but not, uh, well, the word insipid was used to describe the flavor of them. <laughs> yeah, but, th but they have, yeah, but they have, um, they have uh, uh, leaves that look a lot like strawberry, but more rounded uh, uh, teeth than on, um, <clears throat> than on uh, true strawberry. So uh, we were talking, and it, it's probably something that's, di if it's in, it has invaded lawns, it's probably difficult to control. Uh, when with difficult difficult to control uh, broadleaf weeds, uh, now is oftentimes a good uh, a good time to go after them, and sometimes you're gonna you may just need to get a lawn care person to, to use triclopyr or lawn trill. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be about the, the best uh, broadleaf weed control for violets and ground ivy, and and uh, 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 these strawberries are probably difficult to control as well. Should we discuss what I did in my yard? Sure. I just <laughs> let them go. Yeah. They go underneath the mower, and every now and then you get a little yellow flower. And and some of the literature does the uh, indicate they make a, a lovely ground cover. So yeah, these are more escaping, but it's okay. They're they're not too much. But thank you, Paula. You helped us remember about the mock strawberry. Let's go to Mike's question on line five about pumpkins. Hi there, Mike. Hi. Uh, last week you had somebody that called in about pumpkins that were molding. Yes, we did. And. I couldn't see your number on the TV, <laughs> but I thought, why couldn't they just uh, wash them down with some 10% uh, bleach solution? That'd, that'd kill all the mold, and it's on the outside. Yeah, because we talked about how the mold was on it, it came in, they may not have washed it off, did right. nothing, and then it molded. So I like that idea of a 10% bleach solution, because mm -hmm. the spores were already on the pumpkin. Mm -hmm. Chuck Voigt answered the question, and he knows a lot about pumpkins. Oh, so, absolutely. so yes, I think that's a great idea, Mike. So, unless it was just too far gone, but uh, in this case, there's a an idea for some of the viewers to try to alleviate having their pumpkins just go white and mold. Thank you, Mike, very much for your comment. Appreciate it. Let's go next to line six with Lynn, and it's a question about tall grasses. Hi, Lynn. Hello. Um, we have tall grass that has just uh, gone gangbusters. It's been there several years, and it's just uh, we tried and when it was more moist, we tried to spade, and couldn't it couldn't phase it. So how do we control the tall grass that so we really don't want that much of it anymore? It's do you know my perennials and everything? Do you know what it is? I don't know. No, it's very tall, you know, there, tall as I am. You know, there's any number of, of tall species, but I'd treat them pretty much the same. I would okay. expect most of them are, are warm season grasses. Um, unfortunately, you may need a backhoe or a front yeah. end loader. <laughs> uh, some of the clumps get so large and you, uh, it, uh, it's impossible. We have some that, that I can uh, jump on a spade in the middle of the clump and won't penetrate through the clump. So it's, they can be very difficult to... To, to cut up uh, and and I if you can find somebody to come and remove them for you I'd, I'd divide them into much smaller pieces and, and uh, put them in there and then if they're unless they're in a bed if they're in in your yard you can mow around them to help contain uh, contain the, the mm -hmm. spread yeah, if it's a clumping of grass it's probably the ornamentals that the uh, miscanthus mm -hmm. and real common use of, of the big clumping grasses and I've been told that it's because I don't do it. <laughs> I've been told that you uh, cut them off in the spring, not the fall, mm -hmm. in the spring, and then start spading out small chunks of it. And that makes it much easier because getting out one big clump of it is going to be very, very difficult. And, and even some of the edges, you you, you have to Extremely make sure you have a strong strong back and spade. And very the, sharp instruments, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, can, they can really be, uh, um, you know, real woody they developed it and those grasses will die out very heavily in the middle mm -hmm. yeah. yes, so that might be a way that you get a smaller piece mm -hmm. but maybe. it's still I don't maybe. but those roots are still oh, in the middle 
Absolutely. They're very strong. I don't think we have an easy answer. Uh, no, for there is a low, or a low labor and yeah, <laughs> limited labor. Answer. I have yeah. just embraced them, but if they're invading, that does make it hard it make it in your perennials. Absolutely. I just went the other way with the flower bed. Yeah. Zebra gra grass, by the way, is just gorgeous. It's a miscanthus, yes. and it's really pretty. And now it's probably ten times the size of what I started with, mm -hmm. but I've just allowed it. But it's also one of those tough ones to it's get rid of one. when it's. I, I honestly yeah. haven't tried because I'm enjoying it. Or yeah. you, you Even some it. of the natives, I, we've mm -hmm. you know, big blue stem and, and Indian grass mm -hmm. can also yes. be very difficult to, 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 to divide and get in small pieces. I think the idea is to give it room when you start. Have the exactly. ornamental grasses, plant annuals, let them move into those annual spots, yes. move or, the perennials. Or plant some like the Calamagratus, which tend to be a lot easier yeah, to Yeah, Carl mm -hmm. Forrest or Feather Reed grass. Oh, they are great easy. Easy. easier to move. Yeah, that's Absolutely. the I move reason those around it's so popular. A lot. Absolutely. For Boy. multiple reasons it's popular. Yes. We loved your question, Lynn, because now we're discussing all kinds of grasses. <laughs> but it's not an easy answer. I will admit that. Well, let's go to, and this seems early, but uh, Ruth has a question about poinsettias on line seven. Hi there, Ruth. Hi, Diane. Love watching your show. Thank uh, you. I got a beautiful poinsettia uh, before Christmas from my church group, and um, I tried to de um, decide that I'd experiment with it a little bit. Good. And I set it out on my back porch for a while when it started looking bad. And after Mother's Day, when I did some of my annuals, I planted it in my annual uh, perennial bed. And um, I'm just flabbergasted. I measured it this afternoon, and it's 20 inches tall and 15 inches wide. And I want That's... to bring that in. Yes, you do. In a pot, but I don't know what procedure to go through to do that. It's got beautiful dark green leaves and bright red veins, and it's it looks like it could just bloom about any time. So what do I need to do to get that to bloom at Christmas? Well, definitely okay. she needs to bring it in mm -hmm. before frost because the frost will kill it. Um, realize that when you bring it in, since it's been outside all summer, you need to put it in the brightest window during the day to get sun. But you're probably still going to lose some of those lower leaves. They'll probably still turn yellow just because any window is going to cut down some of the sun. But it's important for the poinsettias as well as the Christmas cactus that they get absolute darkness from about oh, five or six at night to about eight o'clock in the morning. And even just putting them in a room where there might be a light outside shining into the window may be enough that's going to uh, mess up the whole thing. Make sure that the soil in the pot is very loose. Don't, uh, I know she said she planted it in the garden, so when she puts it mm -hmm. in a pot, it's probably gonna be heavier soil. If you could get some loose houseplant soil in there too, that'll be nice. I uh, wouldn't really worry much about fertilizing it as much as I'd make sure that you have that absolute darkness every single day. And that goes until you start seeing the leaves uh, it's turned really red and you start seeing the little flowers form up at the top then you can bring it and enjoy it and I have a feeling that if it's already starting to show color she may be getting a poinsettia more blooming right around Thanksgiving instead yeah. of Christmas which would be okay and then keep going and keep going mm -hmm. but do remember that when you bring it indoors it will probably drop some leaves uh, I'm sure it will, especially going through the process of being dug from uh, the oh. garden. That's, oh, yeah. that's going to shock it quite a lot. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the loose soil is really an important issue, and, and so is the light. Totally and, important. And she may want to put some stake and some twine mm -hmm. just to keep the to plant keep from up, yeah. spreading apart, mm -hmm. too. Which and then if it works, let us know. Yes, yes that's, send us a picture. <laughs> that's great. Send Ruth, us a picture. Do. Yeah, that would absolutely. be great to send us a picture, because others can do that just yes. as easily. All right, well, we're going to go to some of our... Uh, questions or show and tell, and I'm going to start with you, Tom. Okay, I have a, uh, a, a email here from Diane in Danville, and she planted a, a, a nice Crimson Queen Japanese maple uh, in her yard, and she wants to expand the area around and underneath it, uh, and she was thinking of some type of uh, dwarf grass that, that might work underneath, that there's, a, there's the uh, picture. Um, 
I was, we were talking about different types of ground covers, perhaps uh, uh, some uh, variegated uh, um, uh, sedges uh, mm -hmm. uh, might might work beneath that. Um, you're going to have to take the rock. I would recommend taking the rock mulch away from the base of the the tree and and. Uh, um, uh, you might want to look at some of the blue fescues, little blue fescue oh, grasses pretty. would be would be would work nice. I like the combination of the maroon and the and the gray green yeah, or gray blue green yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, color of the of the fine fescues. Clump them, lots of them uh, okay. underneath the thing. Yeah, make a make a, nice. a, a mass of them. And um, the other thing is, a lot of these. Um, uh, well, Marianne, why don't you talk about the crimson queen? You said it's a tough one. And it, it is a tough one. It's it's a weeping or mounding form of Japanese maple with the purple leaves, and they're really beautiful. Uh, they're probably a little more easily cared for in our zone, but still, they want to, they need a little bit of protection from the winter winds. Particularly, they get easily. Um, desiccated by the winter winds. Uh, so a little bit of uh, winter protection from our prevailings, which are usually west-northwest, um, is helpful. Um, I would never put rock mulch underneath them. Um, some organic mulch, whether it's uh, compost or uh, shredded bark of some kind, much more healthy for the plant and certainly easier to grow a ground cover under, certainly. Mm -hmm. I think the fescue is a fabulous idea. I love that. That'd be pretty. Um, I, I think maybe in the unprotected area that um, a heavier mulch and maybe a little extra water will get it through that exposure. Okay. Well, thank you both for that. <laughs> and now, uh, Mary Ann, do you yes, have a question to I answer? I do. Um, Karen sent in a picture of a shrub in her yard. She just moved into this house last October, and it was in, in flower. And um, I hope you get to see a picture of it, but it, it was really a lovely um, panicle of lavender. So I'm assuming it's blooming in October. There you are, when, when she moved in. And um, that's not, she thinks it's a butterfly bush, but unfortunately that's not a butterfly bush. But fortunately, it's, it's a lilac. And I think it's one of those reblooming lilacs, if it was blooming in October, oh. certainly. Some of the newer ones in the, in the sure. market, uh, the Korean lilacs, which are a shorter shrub type, Lilac have, uh, well, names like Bloomerang, and um, mm -hmm. there's several of them in the market now that uh, have a second bloom. Their they're first flush in spring, which is like most lilacs, but then they, they have a small flush again uh, later in the season, late summer, early fall. So very fortunate for you, you have a, a lilac that's going to bloom twice. Oh, that's the good news. Yes. Thank you. Totally. Very fun. All right, David. Okay, my question is a person who, also Karen, but I'm assuming it's a different Karen, uh, could be the same, has an ornamental pear, but she's not sure. It looks like it's dying. It didn't bloom much. The leaves are sparse all over. They're wondering if it could be because they built a patio right next to covering most of the roots. But the patio is made out of 10 by 10 patio bricks, so that at least sounds like there's some water that could move down. It's not at least all concrete. Uh, it, this is a double-edged sword. She said it looks like it's dying and it's an ornamental pear. And so my heart, I'd have to honestly say, is not bleeding that much because it is an ornamental pear. And depending on what type, uh, they can be very, very invasive. And Bradford ornamental pears aren't really one of those recommended trees anymore. But it brings to the point that you really shouldn't build anything over the roots of an established plant without planning for how you're going to get water and nutrients down to that root zone. Um, you know, she said 10 by 10 patio bricks, but if they're so tight and if they're sloped away that the water moves away, and if they dug down to get a good base, they could have destroyed some of the feeder roots to the plant. With an ornamental pear, you could have had any types of insects or mainly diseases that are taking the plants out too. The good news is that once you have the patio there and you take the tree out, you can put another tree in and the next tree will adapt to that patio area. And just don't put in an ornamental pear or a Bradford pear. Maybe one or two trees. One or two trees. Japanese maples. Oh, yeah. Or a tree peony. It's not going to be big, <laughs> but it'll be small. Or lilac. Or, lilac. or lilac. <laughs> And I guess there's some azaleas oh. that rebloom too. Yes, there so are. I would go big. for service berry because it would oh, be a beautiful choice. Oh, you can make choice. great jams. And you can just oh, beautiful four four pick the berries yes. right off of there. But fragrance Definitely. would be nice. Fragrance and maybe then a little bit taller tree. Mm -hmm. Oh, we could go on and on, and Absolutely. we probably will, but <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> so anyway, it is a good news, bad news situation Absolutely. for Karen. 
Well, let's go to our mag quiz next. Which hardwood species grows to a larger diameter than any other American hardwood? A. Redwood B. Massive Maple C. Blue Spruce D. American Sycamore D. American Sycamore This species is also a common urban ornamental tree as it is tolerant of urban conditions about trees it's so oh, fun absolutely. we were talking about it before and then that question came up so it's a great time to get out and do some planting of trees yes. perfect absolutely. plant some of these fall perennials there's so many things to do take care of your lawn so all of these fall activities it's really the best time to get broad leaves weeds taken care of too yeah. so and the tulips and the daffodils oh. will be planted oh, plant yes. trees Absolutely. plant trees and bulbs that's right, right. fertilizer lawn uh, certainly exactly. uh, fertilizer lawn there's always something to do so there you yeah. go and we thank you so much for watching we'll see you next time have a great week gardening goodbye <laughs>